Um, so on behalf of the Confidential Advocacy Program, I would like to welcome you all to the first of our webinar series focused on the intersections between identity, health, and experiences of violence. My name is Stephanie McClure, and I am the Confidential Advocacy Program Manager. Today, we all have the privilege of listening to one of our nation's leaders and bringing the end to and healing the trauma from discrimination and violence, Dr. Callie Cyrus, MD and MPH with John Hopkins, as well as co-founder of Time's Up Healthcare. First, a few logistics for today and a quick introduction to CAP and how to access our services. None of the participants in this webinar have any disclosures to report this morning. Today's conversation is not an easy one and may trigger or bring up feelings of discomfort, pain, and sorrow. We want you to know that we are here for you and that at any time during our webinar or after, you're invited to call our support lines to be validated and connected with resources. Please note that CAP has five support lines across the state of Oregon. All lines route to our small but mighty team, which includes Jackson Brown, Stacey Spencer, Hillary Tam, and myself in Portland during normal business hours and then are staffed by our community-based advocacy agency partners who serve those locations so that everyone can get the most up-to-date local resources. I'd like to note that in Portland, that partner is called Safety. In Monmouth, it is Sable House. In La Grande, it is Shelter from the Storm. In Ashland, Community Works. And in Klamath Falls, it is March's House. Throughout today's webinar, Stacy is gonna be staffing the lines and available to provide support while we want to be cognizant that these topics may become comfortable and difficult to discuss, it's also our goal today to help bring hope, support, and share resources that help us all move forward in our individual and collective journey towards healing. We invite you all to also submit questions during this webinar. Unfortunately, we're not able to offer a chat box, so we ask folks to submit questions to CAP support at ohsu.edu where Jackson will be monitoring the inbox and at the end of Callie's talk, will read the questions aloud to be answered. We will not be sharing any identifying or confidential information during our webinars. So if we receive questions that need an individual response, we will get back to you after the webinar. Today, we have two ASL interpreters and captions available through this link, which opens a window that participants can configure to see, still be able to see both the webinar content and the captions. We're very grateful for the EDCOM and language services team at OHSU who have worked very hard with our accessibility providers to ensure that these important components are available to all. Each webinar is going to be recorded and uploaded to our website. If you've registered through Eventbrite, we will send you the link once it goes live. I'd also just like to give a shout out to the committee that's been working over the past several months to bring this series to our community. Joining the core cap team in this endeavor is Ian Jaquist, interim ADA coordinator and Amy Jones, cap volunteer and MD and PH student. CAP's mission is to center the voices of those who've experienced sexual misconduct, including sexual harassment, stalking, sexual violence or intimate partner violence through education, advocacy, empowerment, connection, and support. We do this work by employing our values and our services, structures, and actions. Those values are social justice, intersectionality, inclusion and equity, self-determination, safety, and health. We recognize that all forms of violence and domination are linked, that when we center those most vulnerable and address the barriers that the most vulnerable experience, we can improve supports for all, that every situation is unique and requires an equitable response that is driven by the survivor because they are the expert in their own life. In this vein, we would like to affirm and support our black community locally and nationally, recognizing that there are many reasons that they are calling for abolition and a social movement that challenges systemic racism in every context. We know that the oppression and violence that our black community members live in fear of every day is not new. This community and other oppressed communities in our country are living with generations of trauma that reach back to the colonialization and imperialism of this country, which continues through today. We recognize that the system of policing in our country was founded to uphold and support slavery and maintain control and domination over black people that these roots also included the use of violence, sexual assault, and rape against this community and other indigenous peoples and communities of color. 
a practice that still exists today. Our black community members matter. They deserve to feel valued and to be supported. Those of us with white privilege need to show up for our black community and help shift the burden of the work to reduce discrimination and systemic oppression from the black community. We need to work, work towards transformative change and increasing safety, security, and well being for black people and all people who experience domination, discrimination, violence, and oppression. At CAP, we are committed to advocating against and addressing the systemic and individual barriers that those at OHSU who experience violence face so that they can continue to move towards their goals and aspirations. We are offering this webinar series this summer to assist our law enforcement officers, our AAO investigators, our HR business partners, and all OHSU supervisors, healthcare professionals, and those with the power to address, stop, and prevent violence at OHSU and throughout Oregon to develop their skills in trauma-informed best practices when working with survivors. Throughout my career, I have seen many of my colleagues in these fields take up this commitment and have seen firsthand the positive impact that it has had in the lives of survivors. I am grateful for this and I commend those who are committed to the struggle of growth and improvement. And I hope that you join us in further expanding our knowledge and implementing behaviors to better serve our communities. There's a lot that we can do to help improve support systems for survivors. If you're an individual who works within the systems that are set up to serve these populations, chances are you have seen how the system falls short. You can see areas for improvement. You are positioned to be able to advocate for strategic changes. This is both an individual responsibility and a systems level responsibility. We must recognize that this is a time to step up individually and improve ourselves, but this is also a time to step up to help our colleagues and partners in this work to grow, improve, and be held accountable. Our community as a whole needs to hold our institution and our own departments accountable and work to end all forms of violence that they impose, support, and help to flourish. This is a time to envision a new model that embraces trauma-informed care meets our diverse community's needs and helps people to feel and be safe. It is not okay that so many of us will experience violence in some form within our lifetimes, that so many of us will experience repeated chronic discrimination, violence, oppression, and even murder. It's not okay that there are those among us who feel empowered to dominate, to control, and to use force against others. We at CAP, along with everyone in a position of privilege and our power at OHSU, have a responsibility to do the work to stop this violence, to repair the harm done, and to prevent its reoccurrence. For those of you who are on this call who have survived violence, we see you. We support you. We are here to affirm your feelings and validate your experiences. We walk beside you to acknowledge the impact that trauma has in your life and are here to help connect you with resources to ground, to cope, to process and heal, to build safety and trust. We are committed to do the work and can be called upon at any time to work, support and advocate for positive change. While we wait to see what additional steps that are occurring at OHSU, here are things that CAP can offer in this moment. CAP advocates offer crisis response emotional support, provide information about your rights, systems, and options moving forward, assist and support folks in navigating systems, whether that be OHSU's AAO investigation process, the criminal justice system, or exploring the civil system and the options there. We connect people with resources and support services, peer support programs, and are always happy to provide consultation services to anyone at OHSU who knows is working with, supervising, or advising a survivor, and we'd like to lear learn more about trauma-informed best practices. Specifically for all the supervisors, managers, program directors, deans, law enforcement, HR reps, and investigators viewing this webinar, CAP always assumes that you're here because you care, that you're doing this work because you want to do a good job. You are all in unique positions to have a huge impact on the lives of survivors at OHSU. Your actions may be the difference between a student being able to stay in school or stay at work and achieve economic freedom from their abuser, between creating a safe environment or a hostile one. Your actions may contribute to the trauma a survivor experiences or they may lessen the impacts of trauma and help survivors to build healthy relationships and learn to trust others again. 
You have the power to help OHSU to reduce and eliminate institutional trauma. Now, as always, we have an opportunity to grow, to learn, and listen, to sit with other people's truth and consider our own positionality and how we can individually and collectively together help to address the issues and the structures that enable and lead to the perpetration of continued trauma and violence against the communities that we are here to serve. I'm grateful to be surrounded by colleagues who are committed to doing this work. I also know that we can and must do better. CAP is here to support you as well, and we are happy to have these hard conversations, to talk about best practices, to share the knowledge that survivors have helped us to learn over the years, so that you can better support the survivors who you are here for. We invite you to reach out to us, to include us, to work with us as we continue to do the things we need to do to grow and become better advocates. With the support and direction of Dr. Karen Eden, along with Rose Gurter, James Case of Mongoose Projects, and in partnership with 211, CAP released our Respect for All mobile app this winter for all OHSU members to have a resource to learn about issues related to sexual misconduct, how to access support, learn about reporting options, and how to connect with community-based services wherever you live. Knowing that often survivors tend to confide in friends, classmates, professors, colleagues, and supervisors before they report to law enforcement or AAO, we also created resources to help others better provide trauma-informed support to survivors and help navigate reporting obligations. We are very excited and extremely grateful for OHSU's financial support and CDI's partnership in helping us to expand our app to address racial discrimination. Recently, we received special one-time funding to address COVID-related impacts for survivors. We always have funds to help costs related to emergency housing, relocation costs, and safety and security devices, and child care support in particular cases. But these new funds have allowed us to also access gift cards to cover the cost of gas, food, and essential supplies. Please reach out to CAP through our support lines to get connected with these resources. CAP is also offering free virtual trauma-informed yoga for its members who've experienced any form of sexual harassment, assault, dating, or domestic violence, or stalking at any time in their lives. Sessions will be on Tuesdays from 12.15 to 1.15 begin p.m. beginning June 30th. Sessions will be recorded and posted for later viewing. However, no participant information will be part of the recordings to ensure confidentiality for all. Contact us to sign up for that. We also are inviting all members who have survived harassment, discrimination, and violence to join our Survivor Voices Project and collectively and anonymously assist CAP in advocating for survivors' needs and resources, build a peer support community, and help us identify additional ways that we can support our community at large. If you have ideas for things that would be helpful in your own journey of processing and healing, we would love to hear from you. If it is possible through our funding streams to implement your idea, we will do everything in our power to make it happen. We invite any member of our community to help us in our mission to center and amplify the voices of survivors, as well as helping us to be accountable in the way we continue to build CAP over the next few years to advise us and give us your thoughts so that we can do the work that will be most effective. I wanna be clear, this is not a work group. CAP staff and volunteers will be doing the work. This is a space for us to build community and identify tangible steps and actions that can be implemented at OHSU to improve the emotional and physical safety and well being of survivors and ensure that our rights are upheld and protected. We are also accepting applications for our Survivor Voices Advisory Council. The purpose of this council is to increase transparency around the Survivor Voices project accountability for CAP and our work in OHSU at large, and to ensure that we are centering the voices of all survivors and that we are accountable to and further amplify the voices of communities who experience the highest levels of violence in our society, BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, and people with disabilities. We are particularly looking for members who are part of and have strong connections within these communities are willing to contribute their ideas on the best approaches to advocating for these communities are willing to help us with the development of structure and processes that we use in facilitating this project 
and finally are willing to serve as an ambassador and promote the Survivor Voices Project and help us to increase the number of people at OHSU participating. Again, I want to be clear, while participation in the Advisory Council will be more time commitment than participation in the Survivor Voices Project at large, it is not a work group. Its job is to advise CAP on how to do the work best. Please contact us to learn more about how to join. Um, I also want to let folks know who work with survivors or providing support to survivors that we also encourage you to come forward to us and provide information about the areas you see that could be improved to support survivors and provide practical ideas that will lead to improved OHSU systems, structures, and processes, whether that be in your own department or others. Lastly, we would like to invite anyone who can volunteer with us to join our team. Right now, we are specifically needing help combing through the new Title IX regulations and pulling out anything we can find that will help us in our ability to advocate for the rights of survivors. If you are interested in policy or skilled at creating reference documents and are interested in helping us as we advocate for OHSU policy and procedure changes that are survivor-centered and employ best practices, please join us. This particular project has a very short window and with its regulations going to effect August 14th, and OHSU is hoping to have policy drafted within the next few weeks. CAP also will have to amend our own policies and procedures as a result of these changes and would welcome volunteer support in this endeavor. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanna provide one last invitation to take note or take a screenshot of our support lines and remind you that your, our advocate Stacy is available throughout this webinar to speak with. And also to remind you that Jackson is watching our CAP support at ohsu.edu email account to be able to facilitate a Q&A at the end of this webinar. All right, so today we are joined by Dr. Callie Cyrus, a psychiatrist, my apologies, <laughs> psychiatrist who practices part-time in a community setting while serving as an assistant professor at John Hopkins Medicine. She has extensive background in diversity, equity, and inclusion curriculum development, which has included leading and redesigning of the Yale Psychiatry Residency Program's four-year social justice and mental health equity curriculum, co-development of the RACE framework for responding to patient harassment and groundbreaking standardized patient workshops to manage implicit bias in patient communication. She is also known for her growing work as an advocate within academia and as a founding member of Time's Up Healthcare, where her role is ensuring inclusivity and intersectionality are at the forefront of the initiative. She also has advocacy experience in Capitol Hill, where she has worked as a health policy fellow for Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy. Oh, sorry, <laughs> apologize for that. <laughs> for Chris Murphy as American Psychi Psychiatric Association's 2018 Jan Spurlock Fellow. She offers consulting, coaching, and policy strategy around the issues related to difference through her private consulting business, Dynamics of Difference. Today, Callie will be speaking with us about the intersections between identity and health impacts of domestic and sexual violence. Welcome, Callie. All right, thanks for having me. I'm gonna share my screen, Sarah. For those of you who don't know, Sarah is our amazing um, IT person. All right, I'll get it set here in a second. Should I go ahead? Yes, go for it, and then I'll get the view set correctly. All right. I see your screen now, so should be good to go. All right. So as um, Stephanie, thanks for the introduction mentioned, I'm Dr. Callie Cyrus, and I'll be talking today about how to think about the intersections between identity, health, domestic, and sexual violence. So the first thing I wanna invite you guys to do is that this will be an interactive presentation. Um, there's some software that I use where I'll be asking you all polling questions. They'll, they'll be anonymized. So I won't know who you are. Um, they'll mostly be, there'll be multiple choice. There'll be a word cloud and there'll also be um, sort of a fill in the blank. So what you have to do is actually text Cyrus Virus. I know it's a bit of a cheesy name to um, 22333 just to join our private group. So I'll put this up 
um, once we actually get to the question, but I'd like to just go ahead and kind of get this out of the way as a bit of housekeeping before we get started. All right, so Cyrus virus to 22333. So who am I and why should you trust me? I won't belabor this too much um, just because Stephanie has already given um, an introduction about me, but I think that these are probably some of the most formative experiences that I have that I think make me qualified to talk about this issue to you today. Uh, most, I think most related, most importantly, probably my experience as a founding member of Time's Up Healthcare. And in, in case you guys aren't sure, Time's Up, the organization is the group that's behind the Me Too movement. They have a Time's Up in, advertising, uh, you know, in STEM and in Time's Up Healthcare, which was launched last year, I happen to be one of the founding members. And I also spent about 10 months working on the Hill, which definitely opened my eyes to why we should be talking about precisely these issues, but also the policy that surrounds us. The first thing I want to do is just go ahead and acknowledge the moment, you know, for better, for worse, for someone like me, this is, uh, it's been a great time. You know, I've never had so many people who were actually wanting to talk about racism, sexism, all of the isms and transphobia before. I, it's unfortunate that it took um, not just the death of George Floyd and Tony McDade and, and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, um, but also just a number of other events to sort of kick off, you know, what I think has been a, another civil rights movement occurring in, some of our lifetimes, some of them twice, twice, you know, second civil rights movement. Um, so I, I think that I want to thank you all for joining this webinar right now. And I'm hoping to sort of, you know, include, make it relevant to not just sexual violence, um, but also power and control based violence, which includes the identity of race as well. So we're actually going to jump right into a question. And I'm intrigued to just know how uh, much more often I guess actually you probably can't see if this is here. Um, you folks have been talking about the isms and phobias. And so let me escape this so I can actually get to the polling. So you can see this, what I'm asking you to do, and you can text to, at the top, Cyrus Virus 22333. And the question is, how much more often are you talking about the isms, the racism, sexism, um, ableism, and you know all the phobias since George Floyd's death? And you can just text your answers, our one, two, three, um, four, five. I probably should have been more specific by saying a lot more. Now I'm wondering, what is a lot more? More times in a week, you know? A little more. No one's, no one's a, a little bit less or a lot less. No one, we don't have any avoidant people in the audience. Okay. Looks like a lot more, which is pretty much what, what I expected. Which is why I think, um, you know, even though we're not necessarily just talking about George Floyd, um, it's still related in, in these conversations. I think that's something that you'll see is, um, is, is what you'll see here per the objectives. The first one is culturally competent care for healthcare providers, students, faculty, management, and advocates. So in the talk today, I'm gonna try to get you to learn at least one new piece of information um, in addition to the content about sexual and domestic violence. Um, and so not just how to be culturally competent, um, we'll go over some thinking about trauma-informed approaches, the benefits of collaboration, and any information that I, I, I think you can learn at least one thing, hopefully, that's relevant if you support someone who's experienced violence or sexual misconduct. And so the way we're going to do that is, the first thing I'll do is I'll outline the scope of the problem of power-based personal violence, I will outline how to think about your role as an individual, how to think about your role interpersonally with others, and how to think about your role in conjunction as a, with other community members. 
So in terms of the scope of the problem, I guarantee it impacts your life in some way. Um, I, I think at this point, just with the Me Too movement, which is which has added a great deal of visibility, I, I don't know how many people can say they've never met anyone who has um, not been a victim of domestic or sexual violence, which is really unfortunate. But I think the good thing is that is at least it's coming to light and more people are able to share what's going what's going on with them and actually add to how big the scope of the problem is. So for those of you who aren't sure, um, if it impacts more than double the population of your state, I'm pretty sure it impacts you in some way. And you know, the statistics say, you know, on average, nearly 20 people per minute, I think this might actually be more increased with recent numbers, are physically abused by an intimate, intimate partner in the United States. So this equates to more than 10 million women and men, and the population size of Oregon is 4.218 million, at least in 2019. So this is a great, great deal of people. Um, if you don't think that that was enough proof to sort of that it touches your life, Think about it in this way. On a typical day, if there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide, I'm sure there's somebody either in the audience or, or that you know who are responsible for answering those hotline calls, whether it be volunteers, whether it be students, whether it be jacks, or you know, intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of all violent crime. I know at some point we'll have some enforcement officers, policemen, and or others who are responsible for re responding to violent crime. So this impacts them. Only 34% of people who are injured by intimate partners receive medical care for their injuries. And so if you are a physician, if you are a counselor, if you work in a medical center as support staff, whatever kind of staff, this touches you. And if none of those apply to you, I guarantee you fit in this statistic. A study of intimate partner homicides found that 20% of victims were not the intimate partners themselves, but family members, friends, neighbors, persons who intervene, law enforcement or, or bystanders. And so at some point in our life, we will more than likely be included in this group, not necessarily as someone who was killed, but as someone who may be adjacent to someone who was impacted through domestic violence. So just to zoom in to Oregon, um, where you guys are, so this is, these are some demographics from 2018 and locally. Out of a total of 31 victims, 65% of them were killed. So it's over half of victims of domestic violence were actually killed. So we're not just talking um, a traumatic experience. This, people go on to lose their lives. Of the 19 female victims, 79% were killed. 79%. And of the eight male victims, and let's not forget that men are impacted in this as well, 63% are killed. So what this shows us is that when someone is involved in domestic abuse, their chances are over 50% over that they may end up being killed at, at, at some point. This is what the trends are, set, are suggesting. So in case you were wondering, and this is also data that's specific to Oregon um, on on uh, the number of victims and, and the relationship to the perpetrator, so you can see that 56% were a former or current intimate partner, which I think is something we, we, we hear quite often, or their family or a victim of the perpetrator. So even if you're a family, you're a family member, you're at risk. So not just, so for, don't, don't forget that, just because it's not you who's actually being the partner abused, you're still at risk. That's how wide the breadth of you know, domestic violence is. I also thought it was interesting just looking at the manner of deaths. Um, in 45% of those, you can see are shooting, which is just interesting thinking about gun laws and, and the reach of gun laws. And again, when you're thinking about policy in this issue, it really touches all areas. And then 25% are unreleased or unspecific, but the next highest is strangulation. And so one thing I, I wanna highlight is that, you know, I'm not gonna, I'll at some point go over some stats, but the trend is, is that when you're looking at the intersections of identity, including race, non-binary gender identities, and sexual minority statuses, your risk of victimization rises. So we're not just talking about gender at this point, gender identity, we're talking about the number of minority identities that you add on, the greater your risk. So just think about that for a second. So in terms of the actual numbers, who faces the highest risk? So it's typically adolescents or young, young adults. Um, so ages 20, 12 to 34, the highest risk years for rape and sexual assault. 
21% of transgender, queer, and non-conforming college students looking in this population have been sexually assaulted um, compared to 18% of um, non-trans, gender, queer, non-conforming women. So it's a high amount of, of women in college in general who have, who have been sexually assaulted and 4% of, of males. And then I think what's important to highlight is that American Indians are twice as likely to experience rape or sexual assault compared to all races. And this is something that is consistently confirmed in the literature. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but I wanna make sure that when I'm mentioning types, I'm mentioning sexual violence, that we understand that it's not just um, sexual assault. There's all kinds of forms of sexual violence. And so I'll just mention them and you will know that this resource is here on the RAIN website if you wanna look more into it. There's sexual harassment, stalking. Um, you know, they're, you're the survivors of a child sexual abuse. People using technology to hurt others, which we know is increasingly popular this day and age. Sexual abuse by medical professionals, and it happens. I know more recently this year, an ER doctor who sexually assaulted um, a black woman and nobody believed her, and he had done this to multiple other women. Sexual exploitation by helping professionals, especially as it pertains to trans women. There are some stats that say that trans women can actually be sexually assaulted at a doctor's office. There's multiple perpetrator sexual assault. And I think this is an interesting uh, one to mention because sometimes these can be combined. So the number of, of gang rapes or group sex events that may be televised um, or, or broadcast on technology. So just think about how many people might not undergo, might not experience one type, but multiple types of, of sexual violence. There's also elder abuse, um, which is interesting given the policy landscape because you know elders kind of fall in this um, really tough group to, of people who are monitoring their safety, especially if they're in nursing homes or in community nursing homes. Um, there's sexual abuse of people with disabilities. There's prisoner rape, military sexual trauma, and just in general, the legal role of consent. So one thing I want to mention is just a trend of how isolated you think um, some of these victims might be. If we're talking about elders, we're talking about folks in the military, um, or we're talking about adult survivors of child sexual abuse, you can see that a lot of the violence is, is centered in populations or in identity groups that may be more isolated than not. So I know this is a lot, um, and I want to honor that. I also know that it's time to start doing something. I think this is an interesting time. It's, it can be overwhelming, but if the urgency is here to try to intervene in some way. So you're probably asking, oh my God, well, like where, do, where would I start? So I'm wondering, this is not a polling question. This is mostly like you can just think in your head and I can imagine which one of these applies to you, but which of these conveys how you best feel right now? Some of you might be like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, crying in a corner. Others might just be, kind of overwhelmed where you're just you know a bit more paralyzed and i imagine that there's some of us who are just like keep on going i'm ready i'm galvanized like i want to know what i can do so now i'm going to give you a chance to actually reply and this question is um how does all this information make you feel overwhelmed motivated paralyzed or other and so you can reply this one with um i'm sure i'm activated with a word Fucking sad, I see. Motivated, okay. That means the bigger the size I'm told with word clouds means like that is more people are saying it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that folks are motivated. Exhausted, yes. Um, I can tell you this has been an exhausting month for me, juggling between motivated and fucking sad, I'll say. Lucky. I think that's also a, a common feeling right now. I know Stephanie talked about, you know, what can you do with privilege? And I can imagine, you know, feeling like, you know, you may not uh, be exposed to some of these things and, and, and what's your role? Overwhelmed. I saw air. I'm not sure what the air is, is connected to. 
but maybe a breath of fresh air that, that we're actually talking about this. Determined, confirmed that this existed. So all of these are, are valid. All of these are valid. And at some point, I hope that we can all kind of move to the stage of feeling motivated. Although as a psychiatrist, I want to say, I want you to be able to sit with your feelings. So I don't want to move you too quickly. Thanks for sharing. All right. So then for those of you, especially who are motivated or even if you're paralyzed or overwhelmed, how can you think about your role as an individual? And I'm gonna take an approach that also includes my lens on diversity and inclusion here. So in general, the foundation of the way I think about difference and how to intervene is using a public health approach. And so this is a common, a, a pretty well-known model. It's a socio-ecological model. And it essentially is, the, I think the value of this is that it shows that no one problem is just a problem of that person in isolation. We're all really impacted. Um, and so what you really want to do when you're thinking about a public health problem, so let's say, you know, racism has been named as a public health problem. Intrapersonally, so you as an individually, you know, your knowledge, your attitudes, the way that you behave one-on-one -on -one, or the way that you behave in general and how you feel about the way you behave, your self-concept, your idea of how you contribute to the issue um, and, and who you are and, and how you were raised. How does this fit um, in terms of your relationships interpersonally or the way you interact with your institutions at OHSU or even within your own office? And then how does that relate to the way that you establish a community and who you consider to be your friends and your colleagues, who you say hi to, who you don't, and how this is all informed um, and shaped by public policy. And so we're gonna cover these areas, but I wanna sort of break it down in a way that I, I, I think might be a bit more approachable. And so my adaptation of the socio-ecological uh, approach is using this film that actually came out in 2005. And I mean, you don't need to know the plot, but essentially, this guy is, is a budding ro it has a budding romance with this woman and his two kids um, are you know kind of exploring what it's like to be a kid in the age of technology in general. Um, but the title "Me, You, and Everyone We Know" I think is fitting for the way to think about this model. So we don't have to go through each category, but essentially the way I'll break it down today is how to think about you and your role in terms of me. So me, like you know, how do I think about me and my role in this? You in terms of you know, how do you think about the person who's across from you? Or how do you think about your partner? How do you think about your friends? How do you think about other individuals in relationship to you? And in everyone and everything we know, I think is, you know, encompasses institutional factors, community factors, and public policy. So we're gonna start with the me right now. So we're gonna talk about identity. And I, a question I get um, is, well, I'm a white, you know, a straight man. Why does my identity matter? And so identity is incredibly important, one, because we all have identities, plural, and the way we sort of define our identities actually dictates who we see as friend or foe. We tend to stand up for people who we perceive are like us, and we're actually conditioned to protect our own. The problem is that we need to start protecting everyone. So I want to hone this in is that we actually are conditioned to stand up for in-groups. Um, and there are a number of reasons. So biologically, we're wired to help our own. In studies of um, volunteers, and they've asked them to donate, uh, not even their own belongings, but asked to donate some sort of reward that was, um, or item that was given by the experimenters to a person who they perceive to be in an in-group. Let's say you're a student, would you like to donate this to another person who's a student? Or someone who was you know, a non-student or in an out-group? And they found that when they did brain imaging, that the part of the brain that links, that lights up to reward, this is also the part of the brain that lights up when folks take drugs. So it's very reinforcing. It makes you feel good. Lit up when people donated to people who were perceived to be an in group. So think about this. We actually have to work hard to not just stand up for in groups because we're biologically, we get more reward when we do favor um, or give, a, give something away to someone who we perceive to be like us. Not just biologically, but also sociologically in our system. 
uh, in our social systems and in, uh, in historical systems. So if you think about this, the government, the judicial, the executive, and the legislative branch were all created to sort of be, you know, checks and balances on each other. But at some point in time, either through the judicial branch and its ruling on Dred Scott that, uh, you know, he's still a slave despite, you know, living in a free state, the executive branch, uh, the president, you know, who might have, in this case, Woodrow Wilson, segregation is not a humiliation, but a benefit. Um, and then also you have Congress enforcing the Jim Crow laws and the black codes. So you can, you can see that there are, there are social reasons why you may be predisposed and not to take responsibility off of you, but that shape why you may not want to give to a group that doesn't look, look like you, in this case, black people. And then if it weren't for, you know, history and, and our institutions, we're, society, everywhere you look, how do we treat women? And how do we treat, well, you know, what's the perception in terms of domestic and sexual violence? Um, and who are those groups, who do we, who are those portrayed against? And so this is a scene from one of the most popular shows of that was ever created, Game of Thrones, um, a, a really famous rape scene that was, you know, sort of, uh, there was a, a large decry just about why would you even have to portray this? And the fact that you know, this is still a popular show that even I watch, right? Given they've already transgressed and portrayed women in this way. But again, these are all reasons to reinforce why we actually have to work hard to stand up for folks who don't look like us. I mean, also psychology shows, we use shortcuts to judge who's a friend or a foe. So not just biologically, institutionally, also through society, we also in our brain, you know, to, to get through the day from A to B to Z, you can't, you know, super analyze every interpersonal interaction, every decision. We use shortcuts. And so just like the way that we're trying to judge who's a friend or a foe, we have a number of heuristics of formulas of, of you know, trends that we've analyzed of, oh, this is somebody that, that looks like somebody that I've been friends with for years. So of course, I'd be more open to, you know, being friends with this person who looks like, who looks like me. So again, this is what we have to overcome. And then our shortcuts are imperfect with respect to meaning. So even when we do use our shortcuts and we get used to them and sometimes they're right, they may not always you know, be right with respect to the values that we have. So I think this is an interesting sort of study as I ask folks to think about someone kneeling and look at each of these photos and they're all doing the same thing. But what's the valence of each of these for you, right? Like of, of folks kneeling in front of a church in a mosque or, or Colin Kaepernick, like they all might elicit different types of emotions. So even when your brain is like, you know, you know, trying to design who's an in-group and an out-group, and even when your values are that you want to support people who don't look like you, um, it's not that easy. You have to work at it. So you know, just in case anyone's like, well, whatever, I'm not going to buy into this. I don't care about identity. We're all one identity, American. I do what I want. Okay. But that's, unfortunately, that's not the way that everyone, everyone sees it. And this was just an interesting sort of parallel is that in looking through some of the hate crime research, um, you know, and, and I mean, this isn't special or anything, but the way that they designate who the hate crime is against is based on the anti of that identity. So even if you may not you may not see color, which is something that is generally you know who I am is is also part of my color. Like I'm black, um, so I don't want you to erase that. But I want you to see me for who I am. And there are people who unfortunately see me for who I am and do not like me just for that reason. And that's how the rest of the world categorizes us for better or for worse. I don't like it necessarily. Um, I'd like to be perceived for my personality, but that's just sort of the way that it is. And so we have to, even if you don't believe in using identities and categories, your brain is categorizing and other people are categorizing to actually do harm. So just in speaking through some of the hate crime statistics, I think it's important to share um, just to sort of loop in this aspect of not just your, I know we think a lot about gender or gender identity in terms of sexual violence, but you know, but race and how other identities play a part. This is um, some information about the motivation for victims of single bias incidents. This is in 2007 and 2000, 2017 and 2018. And you can see that race and ethnicity bias is, is the highest followed by religion. Um, and I, I think that this is important to think about because in this work of trying to be an ally and be supportive of folks who are um, involved in domestic or sexual assault is that you can't erase their other identities 
um, and that violence might not just be occurring um, for the reason of their gender, but for actual, for other reasons of their identities that again, they can't necessarily control or should not be targeted for. I also thought that this is interesting is that in case you're interested in where they occur, most hate crime incidents occur near residences, homes, highways, um, sidewalks. And why I choose to highlight this is that this is why it's important to be an ally and important to be a member of your community who is open to everyone is because you never know. Like this is, this is how close these incidents are. It could be your neighbor. We're so close to, you know, someone who might be experiencing these kinds of incidents. And so this is actual, the hate map from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I've chosen to highlight, um, you probably can't see because my, um, I'll move my face here. But if you look at the, the gradations of red, the gradient, it's probably a little difficult, but Oregon, just comparably to the rest, tends to be a little more red in terms of hate groups. And so while this number says 15, I, you know, per capita, um, that's why the color is this way, is because of how many uh, hate groups there are per capita of Oregon compared to some of these other places. So you can see where you guys stack up. So think about this in terms of the context in which you're responding to folks who might be experiencing domestic or sexual violence. Okay, let me get back to my full screen, there we go. So this matters because some people, as I'm mentioning, face unique challenges because they have multiple identities. And so this is, this is part of the concept of intersectionality. It's not just that people have multiple identities that intersect, but it's that they can be multiply marginalized by those, by those identities. And so they may not just, you know, need your help in terms of um, protection against uh, sexual assault because of their gender, but they may need it because someone is targeting them because of their race and gender or religion and gender. So not that I want to encourage you guys to necessarily categorize every single person that you see, but I want you to think about individuals holistically as as you know, the entire picture of why someone might be targeted, not just in sort of cookie cutter ways. And I think also another point is that just because we are minorities, by definition, we are fewer. So for those of you who are you know, trying to grapple with privilege right now, those of us who are minorities, we need you. We need the help of others, even the straight white dudes, to value nonviolence against individuals with non-majority identities, because there's so more of you and the problem is only gonna get solved if we're all working together. So I think a common conversation that ends up happening is, is you know, whether or not, I'm, I'm poking fun at straight white dudes here, sorry about that. Um, but, you know, everyone has multiple identities. And, and so I wanna, we're gonna move into the next section. This is where we're gonna start thinking about how we think about our identities. So for me, and I think about my social groups as identities and kind of using this interchangeably. I am a, I say 36 year old millennial because I feel like I'm on the older side of millennials. Um, I grew up in Florida, but my parents are originally from South Carolina. So I sort of identify as a bit country, but also like Floridian, which is a whole nother story. I'm black, I identify as queer. I used to date women back in, I mean, men back in the day. So that's why I may not identify as a lesbian or bisexual. I identify as a soft, butch, cisgendered woman, which isn't in there. Um, I have an androgynous look. I tend to get um, misgendered just because I, I do look androgynous, but I, you know, this is how I identify. A lover of the 80s. Um, I love patterns. I love bright colors. That's an identity that I wear quite proudly. A physician, right? I'm a psychiatrist. That's even like an identity within an identity. Um, country slash middle class, you know, I was privileged in that way. And then more importantly, I think my identity as my mother's daughter um, plays a huge role in who I am. And I think another reason why I'm including this section in our conversation is that, you know, I was raised, my mother was born in the 50s. She grew up in very rural South Carolina before moving to Florida. And so you can imagine in my childhood, I was raised as one of few black children in, in you know, my classes. But I always also would come home and my mother would say, don't trust people who don't look like you because they'll never stand up for you. So you can imagine what that does to the psyche of someone who's surrounded by people who won't stand up for you. And then imagine being in a, in a place like this in a time like this, doing this kind of work. And, and I, so I think it's important to know that 
you know, people operate in this world not thinking that anyone's going to stand up for you because of the reasons, because it, you don't look like me. And, you know, the reality of it is, is that biologically, institutionally, socially, even the way the rules and the shortcuts we have is that the rule is sort of stacked against someone who doesn't look like me to want to stand up for me. And, you know, and I, I, I think that I've always fought against my mother being right in this way. And I refuse to believe that she's right which is why I do this work and which is why I'm including this section is that if you're going to stand up for victims of domestic and sexual violence, I think right now, given everything that's going on, you got to be ready to stand up for folks who are marginalized in other identity aspects. And because we, we all exist as sort of a package, we're not one or the other that you can kind of like isolate, I'm going to fight for this, I'm going to fight for that. This is why a social justice sort of holistic perspective is, is really important in these issues. So, you guys are also gonna do this activity with me. So I want you to start thinking about what are your identities and which are more salient. And this one is going to be open answer. So what are your I what are your top two most salient social identities? Make sure I'm activated here. Strong woman. Queer. Keep in mind that this might also sort of uh you know change depending on the day, the week, what's notable in the news, atheist. White, which I, wh whoever wrote that, kudos to you. I think often we forget that, you know, whiteness, white is an identity. Queer, female, white. So I, I think this is interesting because when I do this activity, um, I get like father, I get mother, I get, you know, student. And I think with everything that's going on in the news, you know, race is, is a really a, a salient um, identity. Comrade, see some of you are gonna get in, into the communist thought, given politically what's going on, very interesting and important. Female nurse, yeah, teacher. Disabled and queer, again. Christian redhead, yeah. And so this is, I think Christian Redhead is an example of, of identity that I think is an, an example of intersectionality that's really interesting to me, is that you, uh, you know, people don't necessarily think of, when you think of oh, racism against Black people or homophobia, you don't, it, it, thinking about hate against Christians or hate against redheads or dislike against these groups is not something you think about. But that doesn't mean that if you are Christian and redheaded that you don't experience that. So that's why I, I hop a immigrant, sister, white woman, you know, why I think it's important to do this exercise and for you as an individual to think about what your identities are and when they're most salient is because that's the way that you're walking around this world. Um, you may be being categorized that way, but you're also carrying, you know, the way that you might be labeled and not included or be an out group. So you have these experiences. And so because you have these experiences, you know, you got to, the proof, not proof, but research shows that some of the ways to reduce your bias is to actually put yourself in other people's shoes. So thinking about experiences where maybe you've been the out group and, and you felt judged or you felt persecuted. Um, and I know that it's, it's kind of tough right now to talk about this because it seems, you know, they, they call it like the privilege Olympics, right? Like which identity is the worst? Which one, which one is like most oppressed? And I think that it's, you know, as a psychiatrist, I know that I value the hurt that everyone experiences, right? Like we all go through hurt. It's just a matter of which context. If we're talking about color of hair, then I think we can all acknowledge, you know, if this is a thing that somebody who's redheaded might have a different kind of experience than someone who's brunette. Um, and so this is the way I want you guys to start thinking about identities, especially when folks come to you for support um, to find out, you know, where was there something else involved in the picture that contributed to what happened to them? So the, I thought it'd be useful um, as someone who's constantly thinking about their identities, just to give you an example of how 
often and where I might feel part of an out group. And these are obviously not like, I don't know that I feel like I'm going to be, uh, have violence against me in these areas, but where I feel uncomfortable, like I don't fit in. And I'm acutely aware that like, I am not a member of an in-group and where I am like, you know, watching my back just a little bit to make sure I'm okay. So gym locker rooms, like again, I've had people sort of look at me like I don't belong in the women's locker room. Um, and it, like, imagine I'm not trans, I'm not genderqueer, how this must be for our trans and genderqueer folks. Um, meeting new patients, I worry that they're gonna doubt my expertise because I'm black or because I'm young. Work meetings, you know, I worry that I, one, this is like where I trigger my being extroverted. Most people don't speak up so much. Like I worry that I'm gonna say something or bring up race that no one else is gonna wanna talk about. Electropop concerts, you can imagine there's not a lot of people who look like me at like electropop concerts. Sometimes meeting my straight white friends, I don't know what their politics are. If they're gonna bring up something that's gonna make me upset. Religious or all white communities. Um, I don't know why I slashed that there. I think I, that's an after, I'm sorry about that. Black, all black communities, you know, there's even politics within the black community. How do you, you know, how I'm perceived in terms of all of my identities, just even though I'm black, like it's, it's just not, you know, you're not automatically accept, accepted all the time. Fancy dinners, you can imagine that someone who likes to wear pattern in 80s clothing isn't always welcomed into these places and feels kind of excluded. Um, and in galas and black tie events. But I think I probably worry about being an other. This is pre time of COVID when I was out and about a lot more, at least six times a day. So you can imagine that's anxiety provoking. And that's not me worrying about being um, having sexual violence against me. Right? Like, so think about how many times people might actually be worrying about these kinds of things. So um, I want, this is not a polling question. I just want you to sort of think about this to yourself, but how many times do you feel threatened or anxious in a space due to your perceived status? Um, and I usually do this activity. I just have folks raise their hand once a year, once every six months, once a month. The usual answer I get is once a week, um, but I'm always astonished at folks who get once a year. I imagine just because of our initial question that this is much more often now. Um, maybe not the threatened or anxious, but at least like how many times are you acutely aware of your perceived status? And so what I want to do is um, I'm not going to take a full two minutes, but I'm going to take a one minute of space where I'm going to be quiet, but I want you guys to just sort of think about where you might feel like part of an out group. And again, I think this is important. Um, and then not just where you might feel like part of an out group, but how you think that, you know, your experiences compare to members of, of who have opposite identities. So you can think about like what your day to day is like and how someone who has an opposite identity might fit into that. You can think about moments where you feel like you're an out group and how someone with the opposite identity might even feel more uncomfortable there. I just want you to sort of think through what it must, you know, what it might feel like um, to not have the privilege or not have, um, you know, that sense of safety for someone who, who doesn't look like you, like what that must feel like. So I talked a little bit over that, so I'm gonna count 30 seconds for you guys. All right, I'm gonna go, cause I realized I'm kind of speeding we still have some more material and I want to get to the end, but keep this in mind as you meet with folks and, and describe, you know, some of the vulnerabilities and experiences you're going through. So, for, so this is a, I can tell you how it feels. It feels isolating. <laughs> it feels isolating when you're the only. Um, and why this is important is that folks who feel isolated um, tend to be, you know, victimized they are easy prey. And so this is um, called the power and control wheel. It's a very, uh, I think a really good sort of diagram that depicts the different types of violence, of control-based violence, control and power-based violence, and the different techniques and strategies that um, perpetrators may use. So you can use coercion and threats. Um, you know, like this is probably the most straightforward, threatening to um, leave you or hurt you. I think this is an interesting, threatening to out you, right? Like that can be a form of abuse. Intimidation, emotional abuse, you know, putting you down, 
using isolation. So controlling what you do. So imagine what this does to somebody who's already isolated, right? Especially um, if you're an LGBTQI or you know trans woman. Denying, minimizing, and blaming. So like something like gaslighting. And this is again, not just sexual violence, right? This is power control-based violence. So this can be like microaggressions. This can be prejudice and racism. You can use children, you can use other friends or other family members as pawns um, to isolate others and to take advantage of them. You can use your privilege, right? You can treat others like a servant or you can be the one who defines your partner's roles. Or you can use economic abuse. And this is gonna come up later because think about all of our students right now who are not on campus and who are back at home um, and don't have access to their loans, don't have access to their normal economic means, um, and maybe in a house with an abuser. So this is just a hone in it, just a drilling again that victims of abuse just want to feel included. They want the abuse to end, but not the relationship itself. So this again, this feeling of isolation that can happen because of your identity. And so feeling like a member of an out group is stressful enough. What's, what's worse is that feeling like a member of an out group and actually being a minority can also impact your health. So this is just briefly, um, you know, social determinants of health is, is a, a concept that is often cited. And there are essentially these factors that I believe shape your identity, but they also shape what you have access to that helps you live a healthy life. So do you have access to economic stability? Do you have a physical environment that is safe where you can get, get transportation to get to work or to get to school? Did you grow up with parents who were educated in reading to you, you know, the studies that show how many vocab words kids under one know, right? Based on parents who read to them. Do you have access to food? We can talk about food deserts, community and social context. Like, you know, is it safe? Do people talk to you? Do they ignore you? Are you the only one kind of family in a neighborhood? And the healthcare system, do you have access to a clinic? Do you have access to COVID testing sites? Um, and so you can think about how many people may not have access because of their identities. And again, this is why the thinking about your identity is important in terms of thinking about privilege and also thinking about how people don't have access to some of the things you might that can determine how healthy you can be. And why this is important is because I think, you know, we think about, oh, well, folks can just pull themselves up by their bootstraps or go out there and stop smoking or go exercise. But you know, in terms of your health and your health, your well-being, individual behavior is only 40% of that, right? So social and environmental factors are 20%, 20%, right? So all those things on the other, like that are uncontrollable, uncontrollable factors do impact your, um, your, your risk. And again, genetics obviously also uncontrollable. Okay, so again, so it's my responsibility as somebody to now solve the social determinants of health, just to help somebody who may be experiencing, you know, domestic or social uh, uh, or um, sexual violence. No, that's not necessarily what I'm saying. That's like a very unrealistic thing for me to ask. But this brings us to the next strategy, which is like now you, in terms of interpersonally, right, in terms of your social network and support systems, um, what do you do to help people to intervene who may not have social determinants of health? or support networks or anyone to advocate for them. And the truth is, is that honestly, you just gotta do something. Cause a lot of people don't do anything. And now, you know, eyes are open and people want to do something. So I like to tell the story about how, again, violence, power and control based violence comes in different forms. So I had my dream job um, and this is not to poo poo on my former institution of Yale but it's to kind of poo poo on academia. And I experienced so many, um, types of incidents where I just felt alone and like no one was speaking up for me. So I wanted to share some just so you get an understanding of how insidious this can be. Um, you know, I once had an attending as a supervising doctor tell me not to project my fear of discrimination because I might miss out on opportunities when I asked about how race will impact negotiation. You know, I had an attending kind of corner me in my office once and say, you know, black people sure know how to dance in some story about the 70s and the Black Panthers. A peer told me that they didn't understand why we kept recruiting students, mainly people of color who had such low test scores. And then junior trainees often sought my advice about perceived negative treatment from this person as a supervisor. So these things don't just happen kind of in isolation and don't have other impacts. You know, during a rotation, I had co-interns agree that a senior resident was treating me unfairly. Um, and I actually broached this conversation because no one said anything. 
I was told that, you know, they were laying down the law because I was scary. And I think what's the hardest is that I wasn't alone when all of these things happened. So again, I want to underscore that this is not, you know, sexual violence, right? But on the scale and on the spectrum of emotional, economic, physical violence, violence is violence, it hurts, right? Again, depending on your identity, depending on the context, depending on the severity, these things hurt. We need advocates, we need people who are there, right? So if we all agree harassment is bad, assault is bad, it keeps happening and it will keep happening. But what stops us from actually doing something about it when we see or hear about it? So this is um, one question, why don't we do anything when it happens? And I'm actually gonna skip this one even though it's an interesting one. I'm too busy to deal with that drama right now. I thought someone else would say something. I didn't have a responsibility to say something or do something. They didn't mean it like that. Oh, it's not really that serious. It's just an isolated thing. We don't need to worry too much. Or I don't have a problem with harassment or inequity. I'm woke. And again, this is an interesting kind of context for this with George Floyd happening. I think we, we all probably think about the answer to this a little bit differently. Um, you know, so there is some evidence about why we may not speak up. Um, silence versus voice, you know, I think it's, it, this is kind of like, oh, you either speak up or you don't. It's not that simple, right? Like there are different ways to speak up. Um, hearing and acting, we may hear something going on, but we may not necessarily process that or even do something about it. We may say we want to do something or, you know, think it should be done. Interactional dynamics can get in the way. Like you, you don't know the relationship between somebody. Maybe you were also afraid of that aggressor and that's why you may not be saying anything or doing anything. Whistleblowing versus bell rigging. I think we think like, oh, you see some sort of violence happening. You have to go out, call 911, go or jump in, right? And, and save that person versus bell ringing. There can be more subtle, more subtle firm forms and you just have to sort of ring an alarm or get people, pe people's attention so that they, they know to step in or personal factors, right? Um, and so these are some evidence-based ways to actually reduce your bias, and I think this is in terms of seeing people as out groups and overcoming that. So one is just checking yourself, right? Like checking your privilege. Don't be afraid to check others, especially your friends, families, right? But don't get assaulted. Sit by that intimidating person. So this is, you know, um, expose yourself to people who don't look like you. Um, and then think about why that person may be, you think that person is intimidating and does it have to do with institutional social norms um, or how you've been sort of socialized? say no to colorblindness, right? Or say no to blindness of identities or thinking that we're all the same and we have the, all, all the same privileges. And learning and listening, right? Like actually going out there and doing that education, don't make somebody have to educate you or putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And if you see something, say something. So most importantly, actually try to do something about it. So now for strategy three, everyone and everything we know, um, this involves institutionally, community, and public policy. And because this is like a lot, the way I've, I've thought through how to work on this is actually by using a case. So let's say um, the case is going to be about Annie. And Annie is a fictional character who's going to show us why victims of power and control um, stay in relationships and need us as allies. So Annie is East Asian. She's a cisgendered woman who started her first year at OHSU last semester. She's first in her family to attend college. She identifies as bi. She does not come out to anyone, especially her parents who are devoutly religious. While out at a party on campus, one of her male classmates from a course in her major is intoxicated and forces his erection on her. The party space is crowded and she can't get away from him for a few minutes. But finally, she escapes. So first of all, based on Annie's identity, she's already at risk. So again, this is sort of the way to think about someone who comes to your attention who is either experienced some sort of violence or is at risk, right? Is a risk. And so one, because Annie is a racial minority, because Annie is also bisexual, right? So these are important statistics. And not just that, but the fact that she's Asian American, first generation college, and from a religious background. So these are these are all of this is the entire picture about Annie, right? And and in and in light of you know these statistics that bisexual women end up experiencing violence at higher rates. 
Do you want to think about all of this as you're approached, you know, when you approach someone like Annie? Um, these are some long-term effects on victims, which I'm going to skip through. But this is why I want to highlight why Annie needs not just one kind of ally, but police, faculty, roommate, classmates, and bystanders who get it, why we're all important in a community or in a system, is that despite, you know, even all these people who might be there, students who are sexually assaulted rarely use formal supports. They're more likely to go to friends, to go to family. Um, and according to studies, only 2 to 11% report anyway to, to law enforcement, right? So even if they don't go to, to someone who rep, who's represented through the college, they may not even go to law enforcement. And then studies have also shown that 0 to 5% have actually made a grievance through a formal university reporting procedure. So the reality is, is that most people aren't going to report their incidents of sexual violence, which is why as someone who's sort of in the support network, being able to know how to respond is really important and to know how to approach the, you know, the picture of them as an entire person is really important. And I thought that this was a really interesting reason why not to report. For instance, and this is a study of college students who actually learned about Title IX and reporting and, um, you know, one of the feedback was, for instance, nothing would actually happen that they would be disregarded, doubted, or blamed for the assault. So this is why we need allies to show up um, and reiterate that these experiences are important no matter who you are. And you're right, right? Annie, we should not like, the weight of the world isn't on us, right? To, uh, to save every, every potential victim, right? There are also resources legally. So this is us getting into the institutional public policy side of, of you know, how can we actually respond to someone who is presenting with like an intersectional identity picture, right? So I think one thing to know is that Annie can start meeting with an advocate at CAP. So she can meet with Jax, she can meet with Stephanie, or she can meet with someone else who might be available. And CAP exists, well, CAP offices for advocates usually exist because of Title IX. OHSU is unique in that it exists because students demanded an office for advocates in 2018, which is funded through a grant program. But that's another resource that Annie has. Um, CAP employees are also special because through Title IX, which is a legislation that dictates, you know, how college campuses get funded for um, athletic programs, but then also how they respond to sexual assault, is um, it provides some, like, you have to require these things. You guys will learn about this in the rest of your webinar. Um, but there are some people on campus who can just kind of who can talk to, these are the steps that you report, and not all of them are necessarily trained to provide actual support and counseling. So it's important to know that difference is that you can go report to somebody, but that doesn't mean they have like the, the training to actually counsel you. And so CAP employees can are trained to do both, or CAP advocates. So some of these other people like ombuds people, RAs, and faculty who are mandated reporters, and we found that these are the ones who are more formal and who end up, you know, don't actually getting these incidences reported to them. Uh, Annie can also seek treatment through the Campus Counseling Center. And as a psychiatrist who worked in a student counseling center, I can tell you that the lines are very long. So in thinking about all of these options, you know, it may, I may be describing them as very rosy, but if you're reading between the lines, you can probably hear that they might not always be available um, to students when they need them. That's important to keep in mind, because then where do you fit in? And so this is kind of my slide, the more cynical slide of CAP has its own limitations. And I also want to just make this as a plug for you all as members of OHSU to support CAP and think about it from this sort of angle. So CAP only consists of Stephanie, two part-time students, and another, and an off, like an office coordinator for eight hours a week. So think about it. Think about how many people end up having some, you know, 20% of, of female college students end up having sexual assault or sexual violence experience. And that's what the office is like, that is supposed to feel these, that to be a support, right? Um, CAP is also responsible, not just for main campus, but five different locations, five hotlines. Right now you have one person who's manning all five of these hotlines. Um, and then what, so they see there are 200,000 patients at OHSU, um, 3,000 students. 
let's have Stephanie confirm that, but just think about the numbers. And also, I, if I didn't mention this before, but the cap office is funded through a grant. Grant funding means it's not necessarily gonna recur every year. So you can imagine that this office has to apply for grants. Again, something to bring back institutionally. So Annie, her fictional character, she chooses not to report. Um, she thinks it's gonna be too difficult because in all honesty, persecution of non-penetrable sex at least for the literature, is very difficult to actually persecute through the Title IX system, but also legally, right? Even if it's against the law and against like um, Title IX regulations and, and rules and laws, right? Doesn't mean you can easily persecute things. So there, there's the rules on preponderance of evidence, and then there is 50%. Uh, I mean, preponderance, and then there is like, you know, um, if in doubt, I forget what they say. I'm thinking about law and order and the way they say it, but you, you know what I mean. So preponderance and then also kind of like you need to, um, uh, no, no doubt to know, whatever, you know, that phrase. Um, and essentially Title IX has been recently updated to change the regulation so that they are not just some sort of preponderance of evidence, but it's actually you need to have with, without a doubt um, you have more evidence to actually um, persecute perpetrators of sexual violence. So imagine what these updates mean for new victims of sexual assault. So I'm not going to get too much into this because I'm not an expert in it, but also I know that um, you guys will have some more webinars on it, but it's going to get even harder to get justice um, for folks who have been victims of sexual violence for that reason. They're also going to have to face um, being cross-examined. That's part of the new regulation. So you can imagine how distressing that is. Um, so just to finish this up, Annie continued her visit. Um, she hopes to be paired and then COVID hits. Campus is closed and a girl that she was seeing she broke up with has been texting her incessantly and threatening to out her to her parents. And so again, in thinking about Annie intersectionally, um, she's Asian American and going back home. We already know that hate crime reports have been up and nearly 18% of the reports were against Asian Americans, at least in Oregon. So that's something to think about when Annie is, is coming to you for support. This is something that I really, I think it's interesting to look up on you guys on your own, but there's, um, they've been having updates on how folks are seeking help from COVID-19 during COVID-19 and they've had an increase in calls um, increase in contacts. Most of the folks are between 25 and 33. They're mostly female um, and, and mostly white and then um, black. But you can just think about folks who are victims when they're not on campus in a time like this, when they may be more isolated. Um, and 90% of that has been emotional abuse. Skip over this part. This is just some more risks related to identifying as LGBTQI. And um, at some point, we were going to talk about what other options does Annie have outside of OHSU. And so I'm not actually sure if Jax at some point is going to have, if they're going to, I'm hoping that instead of doing this as a polling question, because I'm running out of time, that this might actually be a question that gets posed to us uh, through the group. And so if it's not, then we can also just end up talking about it through the group, because I think it's, this is important to know. Um, and so then I'm not sure if these slides will be shared with anyone else, but I had a couple last minute takeaways. And that is just that we matter in the fight against domestic and sexual violence, right? You may know the victim. You may be a friend, a family member or a professor, right? You may, um, you may forge a connection with this person before the event actually happens. And that might make a difference. Um, wouldn't you rather sort of build up your skills of empathizing across difference by then? Um, also want you guys to remember that when you are responding, the top, the first, the strategies I recommend is one, establish safety, make sure that person's um, not still in an unsafe environment. You also uh, want to establish emotional safety with them. You might want to make sure that you are, are the one who's pursuing the therapeutic alliance. You want to encourage them to be empowered, to stand up for what they want. You can't pursue something on their behalf if they're not interested. And you want them to find a way to voice what they want and what healing is to them. I also want to just say a note to think about what restorative justice 
looks like. And by that, I mean, think about the perpetrator in these cases, right? They're still people. So what happens to them in this process, right? So I think this comes in, the, in terms of the process of how do we actually seek justice. So distributive justice is, is thinking about it in terms of, do you want the outcome to be fair? And procedural justice is, do you want um, the procedures that we use to judge to be fair? And so how do you design policies of your department, of your campus, in terms of who gets justice? And that's gonna be the end of, of, of what I'm talking about. So I know that, um, let me get out of my full screen and find WebEx. Yeah, what I do? I stopped sharing. Cool, I have a few questions for you. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, my name's Jackson, everyone. My pronouns are they and them. Thank you so much, Kelly. This has been amazing. Um, and it, I, we did send an email out just reminding folks that this is recorded. Um, right. Please go on ahead and email us your questions still uh, at capsupport at ohsu.edu. So if we run over a little bit, if that's okay with you, Callie, just to answer questions. Yeah, um, that's okay with recorded for people. <laughs> yeah. Also, I want to somehow give you guys my slides because I know I rushed through the end. Um, so we ran out, we started a little bit late. So I just want you to know that that's definitely a resource and I'm okay to stay after the question. Awesome. Um, so yeah, the first question I think is relevant to the, um, the example you gave at the end um, in terms of uh, supports when an individual is not in the workplace that addresses the PTSD and trauma that came from the workplace environment um, or maybe was uh, Re, like they went through some re-traumatization in the workplace environment. So like what do non-OHSU work resources made you look like? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is something I, uh, you know, given that I'm not at OHSU, uh, I'm trying to look through what resources that, so the ones I, maybe Stephanie can help me out with this, but I know that there are community agencies depending on where you are, right? So. I know she gave me the names of them, which I don't remember now, but I will usually, the way this works is that there are either, they're either groups or they're either, you know, fund healthcare centers, but they usually will have support groups. They will offer medical services. They have some mm -hmm. that are specific to LGBTQI type of um, populations. There's also a lot of net, like the national domestic violence hotline. There are tons of, of these like, of these kinds of things that you can reach out to either nationally through a hotline or either through a community agency. Um, but I mean, there's also the mental health care system, which is not perfect, right? So most folks have some sort of community mental health um, clinic nearby them. So if you're not on, if you're not insured, um, you can also go there, but it's a, it can be a one stop that, that you at least try to get in contact with someone who can help you get treatment. There's also a lot of online telepsych you know, sort of platforms right now. But I think that if you are someone who is at, who is a student, who is now not a student, I guarantee you, if you reach out to the office, they're not gonna turn you away and they'll help you um, find folks who are in your area. And I see Stephanie is chiming in to rescue me with this one, as I awesome. see. You're on mute, Stephanie. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. I feel like I'm in a commercial. Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, I appreciate that. There are a lot of resources within OHSU and outside of OHSU. So if you're a student at OHSU, the Office for Student Health and Wellness, if you're an employee, we have the Employee Assistance Program um, and the um, Residence and Faculty Wellness Program as well. Outside of OHSU, um, CAP can refer you to a variety of folks, as well as those offices have um, folks in private practice um, that they that typically refer folks to as well. Um, additionally, I would just also mention that in the civil side of supports uh, for survivors, there's a program called the Crime Victim Compensation Program, which does help to cover costs of medical expenses, including counseling 
for folks um, long term related to trauma they've experienced related to sexual misconduct in some way. Uh, CAP advocates can help you apply for that program and get access to that funding and then they will automatically just uh, pay any sort of medical expenses that that come um, from from that. Uh, and so if you wanted to uh, access services outside of OHSU, um, there are options available there as well. Thank you for rescuing me before I pontificated any longer. All right, um, next question. Um, yeah, thanks for showing where you needed allies in the workplace and beyond to stand up for you. Um, and I guess just curious if you have examples where, that you'd be willing to share of how someone, specifically a colleague with a more privileged identity has stepped in and supported you or even interrupted oppressive behaviors um, aimed at you maybe from a patient or another colleague in the workplace? Yeah, so I think where this works, I have two examples and I'll be quick about them up first. And they're low, in, low effort is what I'll say. So these are things that can be easily done by, by anyone. And so the first is amplification. I think this is something that is, is made a bit of a splash in terms of a catchphrase, but it's essentially, you know, women tend to get um, ignored in meetings or, or you say something and then, um, of, of some man says it and then they, it gets picked up as the idea. Um, but I think something that's happened with me in a meeting where I'm more junior, and that's the way I've seen it in my identity, is not because I was a woman, but as I was more junior and felt more quiet about what I was saying, is I brought up an idea um, that nobody really seemed to care about. And then minutes later, some other junior um, colleague of mine who's a who's a guy brings up the idea and gets sort of heralded as this big idea but then immediately um sort of right after he says it a senior colleague who's a man says actually Callie brought this up and so I think that's a really easy way to sort of just be an ally is by saying oh by the way Callie brought this up first and I think she was saying that we should try to do xyz so it's actually when you see someone whose voice is not being recognized and you you see that then it's recognized you know the next time around is you can go back and give that person credit because we all want to get credit especially if you're more junior or if you're someone who doesn't necessarily participate um, you want to get credit for your ideas i've also had allies i think you bring up a really important point like what about when patients are after or, you know if, let's say i have an incident where a patient is either calling me a name or is being aggressive um, and so the way that i've experienced is sort of best best sort of allyship is, you know, if I'm and I, I'm trying to handle it because it's my patient, I'll have someone not necessarily come over and, and take the responsibility away from me, but come stand with me. Um, and so together we try to calm somebody down and not just like, oh, go back to your room, patient XYZ, but patient XYZ, why would you say that to Dr. Cyrus? How do you think that might make her feel? Do you have an apology for her? Um, and so I think the moral of the story is not just kind of correcting it, but like the net positive on that is actually going above and beyond to say, wasn't that a good idea? Or doesn't that person actually need some sort of like, not repair, but like, let's not just correct it, but do like, you know, a little bit better to say, we see you in addition to helping you. Thank you. That was awesome. Um... And I guess uh, the next question we got was, um, I feel like whenever we report these things, nothing ever happens other than the person who is being discriminated against or harmed gets retaliated, retaliated against. Um, and it seems that a lot of us are scared about the implications for our careers. And do you have any ideas on what we can do about that? Yeah, I think that this is a this is a really tough issue. And as somebody who who is often kind of speaking up and feeling like nobody else did, um, I get how I imagine how scared people are to actually report, especially because you know uh, repercussions are can be quite bad depending on what kind of institution that you're in. So one thing I'd say is um, evaluations. Usually there's a climate survey. And whether that's for an entire campus or for a department, but something I always encourage trainees and everyone around me to do is submit your anonymous evaluations because unless it's caught on paper, then um, it's just going to be you kind of in isolation saying that something is going on. So always fill out those surveys. Some of them can be long, they can be onerous, but it's worth it. So not just you, but try to encourage everyone you know who's also seeing these things happen because 
it, there's power in numbers, right? So I'm assuming that you're not able to actually get someone to kind of stand up with you. Um, and so I think if, again, let's say you're the only person who's trying to say something. I confidentially, I think confidential conversations are really important. So we happened to, at my institutions, I identify who my I'm ombuds people are because they're Title IX, um, you know, confidential people. They're mandated reporters. But if you phrase things, like let's say somebody went through this, folks can tell you step by step. That would be reportable. That would not be reportable. Um, I had an, a racially sort of microaggressive incident happen to me that my Title IX person actually talked me through how to file an informal complaint on mistreatment. And so I think they're excellent resources to have. Um, and number three is also, I think, is you can't, you can't do it alone, but you have to be true to yourself. And so I think that if there's a way to voice or maybe get even get involved in revamping the reporting system, um, I think that's something I know that one initiative I saw happen in my, in my former institution is that we completely revamped the reporting um, system such that the first person who got the news was not like the program director, but an administrator who got training on how to respond and actually reach out to you to say, do you want me to, to broach confidentiality? Do you want me to report this? So actually able to ask for permission before it just goes to the person who knows everything. So I think increasing anonymity and in how you want things to be reported. So get involved policy-wise. Cool, thank you. Um, and I think this one, I tried to ask at the start, it kind of touches on my very first question that came in. Um, but it takes it a little bit further, like what mental health resources are available for folks who experience discrimination in the workplace yeah. and coaching opportunities available specifically for POC folks to participate in self-healing when they're not in the workplace that might address PTSD and trauma? Yeah, um, yeah. So this, yeah. Is a, this is a really good question and a really tough one because, I mean, bottom line is that we know about the mental health care system. Um, and there's not actually a really good resource system for people of color who are experiencing these kinds of things in a workplace. Um, so, but knowing that, what I'll say is, one, use your, so if you're a student, you have access to student counseling. If you're a faculty, there's usually EAP um, where you can get support, or you can also use insurance. There's also a lot of therapists who don't take insurance. I recommend going to psychologytoday.com, putting in your zip code, and seeing who can take you. Um, I think the second part of this is also with COVID-19, insurance companies are covering telepsych um, at higher amounts than ever. And so I happen to be on one of the platforms, um, but there are other platforms out there where they have psychiatrists where you can actually pay per session. Like it's like $39 a session or something like that. So that's that's mental health care. If you, if you happen to know folks who are uninsured, um, I know that through COVID-19, they've also, a lot of states have expanded their access to Medicaid, like you can kind of go and get emergency access to insurance. Um, so that's on the, the, like the therapy side, right? Um, I think in terms of the other resources, that's a tough one And that. I think what I would recommend is the way I found support and my colleagues I know have found support are through linking up with other people of color in your institution who are either on that spectrum of race, right? So they may not necessarily be black or, or Asian American, but linked up with the other minority identities, whether that's the LGBTQI+, whether it is one of the other racial minorities, um, but find allies who may be looking like they're unlikely allies in other places. So I would find, you know, sort of find those other minority groups on campus to see if there's anyone there who can kind of coach you through um, how to be, how to have a stronger voice. And that's probably would be easiest. If you find a group that's the most vocal, you can find out some of the strategies that they've used. Also, I mean, I hate to say it, Facebook. Facebook has so many different groups right now. You know, black women in medicine, black women in English, black, you know, or you know, they have all of these groups where you can find that support. And, uh, and, and people are, are pretty vocal on there actually. Um, and so then, so across institutions, I think would be my other. So I, I don't know if you've gotten any conferences recently. I know it's a little bit daunting to actually like reach out to people you've met at a conference, but I've done it a few times. And I'm surprised at like how, you know, quickly people get back and willingly to actually be support, to be like supportive when they don't know me from like literally anything. 
Um, so I think that you have to start looking in, in, in areas. If you're talking about something that's a little more insidious and a little more um, harmful, I'd reach out to, this is where CAP can also be useful, is that because they're familiar with Title IX regulations, which doesn't just cover sexual trauma, right? It covers like discrimination, gender discrimination, and black women and minority raised women are, are, are covered under this. And, and men too, you know, I, not to um, have a binary gender with this. And, but um, I'd reach out to folks who know the resources on college campuses. There's also, if it gets to that, there are a lot of lawyers who offer confidential advice I recommend the Times Up Legal Defense Fund. Let's say you're having some workplace discrimination, you're not, you're not even sure if you have a case. Sometimes lawyers will give you confidential feedback. Uh, and then they might be able to direct you to folks that they know. But finding coaching is the kind of thing where you just kind of have to look it up. Like I, the times that this comes to me, I either can kind of provide that coaching informally or I know enough women who've gone through this where I kind of do a one-on-one -on -one setup. So feel free to reach out to me, whoever you are, if you'd like more advice on that. Thank you so much, and thanks for offering your time further outside of here. Um, the like, last question I would say that touches on that, that came through, um, and then we can wrap it up. Um, and feel free, like, if we need to follow up with people by email with this, that's fine too, if you wanted to end. Um, but the, one of the things uh, was just how to support individuals also in terms of exploring their identity or gender and what to do to ensure the language around policies supports those people and supports protecting those people um, in terms of introducing that conversation to our OHSU community. Um, and if you have any thoughts to add to what you just said um, in terms of identi exploring identities and, and things like that that are maybe a little bit more invi invisible at first, like gender, um, that would seem to be another question. And yeah, I know up. you've given us so much of your time. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I have time to answer. I, I think that there is strength in numbers is what I will say. It does, I think, you know, a squeaky wheel can get the grease, but there's also strength in numbers, especially if you are um, a student who's paying tuition, if you are a faculty who's part of a union or not part of a union or, you know, a faculty member who has departmental support. Um, if, if you have access to a hospital in addition to a department, like an education, so there's the, you know, hospital side versus the educational side, but this, and then there's also, there's always an office of diversity somewhere. I don't, it's called something different everywhere, but there's always an office of diversity. I also wanna recommend that office to the question before. Um, but what I recommend is, is there strength in numbers and also sort of getting the ball rolling and getting these things on paper really early. So voice your complaints either in the survey or go talk confidentially to the person who runs the office. Just, give them some feedback. But, you know, being able to have folks who are not just you, but present, you know, a, a different side of it. So the more people they see who are experiencing the same issues, so they can't say, oh, that's just the black group on campus is experiencing that. It's like, no, the black group, the white group, the gender queer group, you know, everyone is experiencing it. And a lot of the times, to be quite honest, everyone's experiencing it. If you're experiencing it and you know two other people who are experiencing it, People are, are, I mean, we talked a little bit about how it's, it's, you know, people are nervous and it, there can be repercussions to speaking up. But once, you know, folks sort of know your, your, there are ways to work with others who might be afraid to speak up to work as a team to get that to happen. Um, and, I, and, and why I say reach out to folks who may not look like you or the issue you're talking about is that they are stakeholders. Somehow figure out how your issue impacts everyone or who the players are involved and and get them involved because that makes it different policy wise. And so I think this also touches on the question about identity and that, you know, I t you toe a line, e even in going through what are our different identities and labeling them, we tend to use the categories that we know, right? But yeah. all, people, all kinds of identities that you don't know about. If you're like the swing dancing guy, you're the accordion person, right? And, and so I, I, I I don't want you to get cut off, but I just got told we will get cut off in one minute. <laughs> so you, you never know who's an ally. And so just approach them openly. Assume you don't know anything and just start with open-ended questions. Because you know, like, even though you might assume you know somebody's identities, you really don't know. Thank you. So they ask questions. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you to everyone that helped make this come to fruition. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Um, and thanks, thanks for having me.
Sorry for running over. Thanks for having me. No, you, you, do, you do not need to apologize. We had technical difficulties. Thank you so much for the extra time. Thank All you, right. Kelly. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.